You have you reached, reached Deception, Deception Detection, Detection Radio, Radio with K from the Deception, Deception Detection, Detection Network. Network. Please, Please stay, stay on the line while I connect you with the truth. truth. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Deception Detection Radio. I'm Kay. I pray you all had a blessed week. Tonight, joining me is a very dear brother in Christ and the host of Omega Frequency Radio. I have with me BDK, and BDK is amazing. His broadcast is amazing, and I encourage you all to tune into it. It is a true walk with God. Everything from God is in his broadcast, and you can feel it. And I just want to welcome you tonight, BDK. Thank you so much for coming on with me. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's awesome to be able to discuss the topic we're going to discuss. This is great. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand or are not even aware of it. And I'll tell you what, why don't we go ahead and open with a prayer and then we're going to just jump right into it. But I do want you to give out your contact information too. Sure. Would you like me to do that now? If you would, please. Sure. You can go to omegafrequency.com. That's just my ministry name with a dot com after it. And there you're going to be able to find all the podcasts. You're going to be able to find the archives of previous episodes. You're going to be able to find our social media accounts because our social media accounts will give you up to the minute uh, headlines, news headlines that are fulfilling Bible prophecy as they happen, as news breaks. They pop up on Twitter. They pop up on the Facebook. They pop up on Tumblr. We also have a daily prophetic uh, news online free newspaper called Omega Frequency, The Daily Signal, and it collects all the day's uh, headlines in the news sources and puts them into one paper so you can take a look and see, oh, this is what happened in politics today, this is how it fulfilled Bible prophecy, or this is what's happening in science today, this is how it's fulfilling Bible prophecy, things of that nature. But the the newest detail that people might not know that have maybe heard this before is that I'm now a part of God's Property Radio. And God's Property Radio is family of podcasts that are very cutting-edge, alternative, fringy-type topics. And I'm part of that family now. So you can actually go to godspropertyradio.com and you can download my podcast there too. And as a matter of fact, I tell people now, if you want to subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode, the best way to do it is to actually go and download godspropertyradio.com and subscribe to that. Instead of subscribing to me like in iTunes or places like that, subscribe to godspropertyradio.com and subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast app there. You'll get every single one of my episodes that are released weekly, but you'll also get lots of cool other podcasts that are very similar to mine. So if you want to check out some other stuff that might edify you in the same realm that you hear on my podcast, I'm part of that network now, and I highly recommend it. So go check that out. That is awesome, BDK. I wasn't even aware of that, and I follow everything that you do. Well, I just it, it just came out in episode 50, so it, it happened just a week or so ago. Hmm, I don't know how I missed that. Well, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. No, Oh, thank you. No problem. That is just so can, awesome. I, yeah, God is good. Uh, he's doing awesome things with this ministry. He's opening up doors that I never thought what he would have opened before, and... God's just good. It just goes to show everyone out there that, you know, no matter what you're called to do in life, and maybe you're just called to stay at home and be a mom or a dad or to love on your kids, or maybe maybe you're a shut-in, and all you can do is pray for people. If you are faithful just to do that which God has called you to do, He will do things with you. In the end, that you would have never guessed, as long as you are obedient to the Word of God first, and then obedient to your calling second, He will take you on a journey. He just wants you to take one step today, and then just purpose in your heart that you're going to take another step tomorrow, and just follow God home to the completion of that plan. Run your race with everything that's in you. Finish the race strong, 
and stand with other believers and doors will open in your life that no man can shut. Amen. It's a beautiful way to say it. Would you like to go ahead and lead us in prayer? Yeah, I'd love to do the opening prayer, Kay. Okay, thank you. Father, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. And we thank you for this moment in time where we can gather together and break your word like we do breaking bread, where we just dive deep into the subjects of God. I thank you that you're not limited by time, that you're not limited by space, that a person listening to this right now on Sunday can listen to it five years later on a Thursday and still get the same anointing from it because it's not what we say, it's what your words say that you bless. And Lord, as we lift up the Word of God tonight and we talk about the subjects that the Word of God says, we ask that your Holy Spirit anoint the words of God. Take us out of the picture, Lord, but anoint your words so that they will not return void. And Father, I pray protection over every mind that we're to listen because we know the devil likes to come and he likes to distract our thoughts when we should be digging into the truths of God. And he likes to steal away those seeds of truth that are just firmly planted in us. And I, I stand against him now by the name and the authority of Yeshua and the blood of Christ. And I plead the blood over everyone's mind right now. Father, if there's anyone out there who would have any question in their heart, and if they're truly saved, if they were to die tonight and stand before you, if they're unsure that they would make it into heaven, I ask that tonight they get sure. And I ask that you open their eyes to the power of the gospel because the Bible says that no man can come unto you unless they are drawn by you. And so I just believe that you are the drawer and that you will draw them tonight. I thank you praise you. Protect us while we do this interview. Protect the equipment, Lord. Let everything turn out okay. Thank you for your love, and we love you back because you first loved us. I pray this in the name of our kinsman redeemer, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, BDK. Thank you, God. He's good. Amen. We have to what I believe is going to be a fascinating topic tonight, and that is the Reformation. Uh, like I said, a lot of people are not familiar with it, but we're going to get into where the first Bibles, how they were able to be printed, what people went through, to be able to make it possible for us to be ha able to have our own Bibles today. There was so much that people had to endure, and it wasn't just Christ dying on the cross, but that persecution continued after mm -hmm. the crucifixion, and people went through so much, and God guided them and made sure that we eventually were able to have his word to be able to read. And I'm really thankful to have you here with me, VDK, to discuss this. Where would you like to start? Well, I, I think the first thing that we really need to do is just say what the Reformation was, because the Reformation was the period of enlightenment that happened after the Dark Ages. And a lot of people kind of put the Dark Ages from around 400 AD to 1400 AD. And basically what happened was the the world went through kind of like what they called the dark ages where there wasn't a lot of learning there was a lot of disease there was a lot of pestilence um the catholic church had a stranglehold on religion and not only a stranglehold on religion but a stranglehold on politics they were more powerful than the king the pope was at the time and there were very specific reasons for that which we'll get into later on in the episode but along came a man named Martin Luther who pounded 95 theses on the Wittenberg Chapel door and started a revolution of truth that said, wait a minute, the Catholics teach that you have to do all these things to be saved and that you can only be saved through the Catholic Church. Well, it's through Jesus that you are saved. It's through a living relationship with him. It's not by works, but it's by grace through faith that you're saved so that no man can boast 
in and of themselves of their own salvation because we don't save ourselves. There's not a thing we can do to earn salvation for ourselves. It's a free gift, and you can't pay a penny of it. And that was a truth that Martin Luther unlocked. Now, was Martin Luther perfect? No, he wasn't. He was a man that God used in imperfection. There were things about Martin Luther that weren't necessarily the best because we're all fallen human beings. But Martin Luther was obedient to God, and he was a man of conviction. And what he really was, more than anything else, was he was a man of the people. And his whole thing was, I want to make the gospel so available to people that your common man can understand it. Because if the common man cannot understand the gospel, all is lost. So that's why the Reformation always fascinated me. It was it's it's really the it's really a true underdog story of one man versus a religious system. And the reason that Martin Luther always kind of fascinated me was because I grew up Lutheran. My dad was a Lutheran pastor. He uh came from one of the strictest Lutheran synods and I grew up in church under my dad who taught me everything about Martin Luther. As a matter of fact, I don't usually use my real name, but my middle name is actually Martin and it's named after Martin Luther because my dad had that much of a respect for this guy. So I heard a lot about him. I heard a lot about his story. Um, I even went to a Lutheran parochial school. Um, I even wanted to be a Lutheran pastor when I was a young man. So I went to, as a freshman, I went to a preparatory school that basically was going to train you up until uh, Lutheran college so that you could go into Lutheran seminary. And we learned about Martin Luther from the get-go, right away in freshman theology class. There was a class on church history, and of course, we wanted to talk right about Martin Luther and his period in church history. And I remember learning about this guy and what made this guy tick, and I was just like, wow. Like, I know that we're Lutheran here, and and we're putting this dude on a pedestal, but, you know, he, he does have some things that he did that were pretty cool. Now, I'm no longer Lutheran. I'm... I am just a non-denominational, spirit-filled Christian who mm-hmm. loves Jesus, bought by the blood, filled with the Holy Ghost, as everyone is who is bought by the blood. And I, I still, though, think about that period of time in history because, yeah, it was the Dark Ages, but even though those times were dark, God broke through those times in a powerful way. One of the things that I love to do is I love to study church history. I love to study old time revivals. I have books on every single move of God and I love to read them. I love to read the works of Spurgeon. I love to read the works of Finney. I love to read these works. And even though I might not agree with everything written in them, what I love to see is these people's passion and these people's hunger for God. And I love to see the conditions of the times that these revivals happened. And when you start to look at the conditions of the times, you see that there are similarities in all of them because God moves according to his word and the promises he makes in his word. So it, whenever people live according to those promises, you'll see great things that are being done. And we look in this world today and we say, man, it's kind of dark in this world. It's not quite the dark ages, but things are spiritually messed up. Can God step in and cause another reformation? Could he step in and cause a revival or a spiritual revolution within a segment of the church? Because it probably will not happen throughout the whole entire church, but it could happen in a segment of the church. And even Martin Luther's Reformation didn't change the Catholic Church, but a segment of the church changed. And Mm -hmm. that segment of the church ripple affected through everything. So even a portion of the church in the hands of God can be a mighty tool. I, I want to just, before we get into this, I just want to lay, and, and you've had me on the show before, people have heard me on Omega Frequency, so you know that everything that I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm going to put lots and lots of scripture in it. Um, I call it lacing the message with the word of God. And Amen. I do that for a very specific reason, because you might disagree with things that I say, and you should. Everything I say as as a human being, as BDK, you should test the heck out of it, especially if I'm quoting scripture. But you may not agree with my own personal viewpoints, and I'm the first to say, well, this is just my personal viewpoint. 
But the things of the scripture are so important because those are God's words. And you can learn from what God has to say, and you can take what God has to say to the bank. Because I'm not a prophet. I don't prophesy that things are going to happen. I don't predict that things are going to happen. I'm not saying that there's going to be another revival or reformation. But I am going to make a case tonight that there could be one because the conditions are ripe for one. And we'll even begin to see that everything that was happening back then is happening right now. Yes. Again. And God is a God that changes not. So I'm going to start with this foundational scripture because a lot of people from the get-go are going to tune right out because we've written America off. A lot of Christians that are watchmen even have written America off have said, God's done with America. I'm done praying for America. I've heard people that I respect even saying, stop praying for America because God's done with it. Pray for judgment upon America because America is so apostate. It's beyond hope. I've heard people say that we're going to get raptured on up out of here before the tribulation starts because if we don't, then we're all going to be so beat up that God's going to be hopeless and he's not going to be able to use the church. Or if we somehow are here during the tribulation, take your pick, whichever theological side you fall on. I'm not here to debate the rapture with you. But what I will tell you is this. There's a theory of thought that says that if we are in the tribulation, we're going to be so beaten and broken down that we're just going to be lucky to survive, that we're going to be running and ducking and dodging and just trying to scrape by, afraid for our lives and just trying to hide out from the Antichrist. But prophecy says something different. And let me share with you what prophecy says as the key foundational scripture for what we're going to talk about tonight. Daniel 11, 28 says the Antichrist will set up his kingdom and he will do exploits, okay? But then in verses 32 and 33 of Daniel 11, it says this, speaking of the same time frame that the Antichrist is doing his exploits, it says that the people that know their God, who have a relationship with God, who know their God intimately shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand amongst the people shall instruct many. Mm. Did you catch that? Beautiful. It doesn't say they that know their God shall be weak. They that know their God shall be beaten down. They that know their God shall just hope to scrape by, afraid for their life. They that know their God shall run from the Antichrist. No. It says, they that know their God shall instruct people. Just like Martin Luther made it available, the instructions of God to be available to the common man. It says that in this time, we shall be strong. We shall do exploits. We shall train people. We shall instruct people. That word exploits in the original language, and you can look this up for yourself. It means to take action and prevail against something. So far from us being a weak, broken down, anemic church, and how dare we say anemic church? I am so sick and tired of people who actually use the word anemic church. I don't care how good of a watchman you are. If you are saying that the church is anemic, shame on you, because what you're saying is that the blood of Jesus is anemic. Amen. And we have the strength of God. We are given the power through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'll calm down for a second because I tend to get worked up sometimes. That's all right. We need to get worked up. This is the time to get worked up because this is such an urgent matter. We can't afford to not be worked up. Amen. So, I guess what I'm basically trying to say is that the Scripture not BDK, but the scripture actually says that in the end times, there's going to be two spiritual movements going on at the earth. And these two spiritual movements are going to be running side by side with each other. They're actually going to be in opposition to one another. They're going to be happening at the same time. One On one side, you're going to have hell. And on the other side, you're going to have God's remnant. And if you think that just because the church is going to be going through some times of dark persecution and deception, or just because the Antichrist is going to be doing his exploits and there's going to be a satanic movement going on, that God will be outdone in that moment, 
then you have bought into all the gloom and doom hype that you're hearing nowadays. And it's a type of hype that says that it is even within the realm of possibility that our God could ever be outdone by Satan. If you, if you hold to that theory, then you haven't familiarized yourself with the promises of the Bible concerning the power and the authority and the strength of Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim just means the Lord God, which literally means the most powerful of all that is worshipped or God, meaning anything that is spiritual in nature that calls itself God or calls itself something to be important, Yahweh Elohim is the king and the absolute ruler over every spiritual fourth, whether that spiritual fourth is real, made up, or in someone's mind. Amen. This is a God who will not be outdone by hell. Not because of anything that's important in us, but it's his name that's at stake. It's his glory that's at stake. It's his fame that's at stake. So he will not be outdone by hell or anything else. Because if hell comes in and tries to usurp God's glory. You know what my Bible says about it? He says he will not share his glory with anyone. Mm -hmm. And that includes Satan. So yeah, we read the we read the Bible and we sit back and we say, oh, the Antichrist is going to be so, so powerful. And we read the book of Revelation and we get that out of it. Yeah, I'm not here to debate that. But when you read the book of Acts, right, we have a different viewpoint on that. We say, oh, well, this is a book about how the church is powerful. This is a book about how the church is doing exploits for God. This is a book about how they overcome. Okay, but in that book, wasn't Caesar a type of the Antichrist there? Weren't Christians getting fed to lions in the book of Acts? Weren't yes. people being persecuted? Weren't people being beat down? You tell me. The stuff in the book of Acts goes into more graphic detail than anything you're going to find in the book of Revelation, what happens to Christians. But yet the book of Revelations is a gloom and doom book, right? The book of Revelations is a book that says the church is defeated. No, the book of Revelation says, yeah, Satan is the enemy of the church, but the church overcame him. By the blood of Christ and the power of his testimony. Now, will the church be persecuted? Yeah. Am I saying that, am I, am I into de dominion theology here saying that we're going to overcome the world? No, I'm not saying that. I don't believe in dominion theology, not even for a second. I believe that Yeshua is going to come back and set up his kingdom. That's not what this is about. This is about his church being obedient even in their weakness. Now, I know there's 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 so much evil going on today and this is how it ties into the reformation because in the reformation during the dark ages it seemed like God was silent that it was dark that there was no communication from God that people were starving for a word from God it seemed his presence was so far away it seemed hopeless but we need to remember two things when it comes to weakness and hopelessness and the first one is this God always can use our weakness as a canvas to glorify himself, and he'll do it as a testimony of his strength. But it comes down to, will you obey God and make yourself available in your weakness to be used as a testimony of his strength? And where do I get that from? Well, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So even if there is tribulation, even if there is trial, even if the Antichrist is beating us down, and, and he will, the Bible says that he's going to come to try to wear out the saints. But even if he does, even if we are weak, then so what? It's just a bigger canvas for God to paint on. And then secondly, we must remember that historically, before the biggest moves of God, he will always withdraw his presence for a little while. He will remove his presence. It'll seem like he's gone away. It'll seem like he's checked out of the office and he's not taking messages. He will draw himself away for a very specific reason. He does it to create a spiritual hunger amongst his people. It, it, he does it so that we get so desperate, we start seeking him out. We start crying out to him, God, we need you. We need you to show us. We need something to change or otherwise it's all for nothing. Now, some historians actually say the Dark Ages, like I said, started in 400 A.D. and ran up until 1400 A.D. Now, think about that. That's a thousand years of silence. 
That's a thousand years of the Dark Ages. That's a thousand years of bubonic plagues. That's a thousand years of Catholic Church strangulation of society. That's a thousand years. That's the same amount of time that Christ will reign on the earth. That's how long a thousand years is. Think about that. Now, I personally believe that it took that long because he was going to birth something so huge, so huge, that he had to remove that presence for such such a long time because this move was going to radically alter the course of church history. There was such and we and and the spiritual hunger was seen like really first and foremost in Martin Luther's life. There was such a spiritual hunger in that man to get a hold of God, to have just peace in his life that he would be saved, that he actually wrote that he would have killed himself if God didn't move on his behalf. And we were talking about Luther together, Kay, before this interview and last week too, and you uncovered some things about his spiritual mind frame at the time and some of the things that he would do on a daily basis to really go after God because he was so dissettled in his spirit. Would you like to share with us oh, yeah. what he was doing? It was amazing. I mean, I've been studying the Reformation for a while, and I read some things that I hadn't been aware of. But he honestly, when he would feel this need that he just wasn't living up to what God wanted him to be, and he felt that he needed to be cleaned of his sins, he would go into a uh, confessional and he would spend uh, up to six hours at a time in a day. So some of those confessions, he would go in four times and stay for six hours. And he would leave and he would turn around and go back because he felt that he just was not worthy, that he had not cleansed his soul enough. And he also did the um, what is called the self-flagellation, where he would um, beat himself with, uh, it would be strips of leather, or uh, it could be off of a tree, where people will constantly beat their backs because they feel that they need to make atonement for their sins. And Martin Luther actually went through this, and he would go out, he lived a very humble life. He would be seen taking brushes and rags, cleaning the bricks in the streets to make them clean. So he was always about trying to find a physical way to cleanse himself of his sins until he had the revelation, which is amazing. And then he realized that there was more to God, so much more than what he had had ingrained in him growing up. Amen. And that's and you're right. You know, Martin Luther actually became a monk for the reasons that you said. Yes. He actually had an encounter when he was when he was a young man where he almost died in a storm in a carriage on a road. And he felt such a holy gri- fear grip him. He was like if I died tonight, I would go to hell. And even though at this point he wasn't a monk, he was doing everything the Catholic Church told him to do. He was buying the forgiveness of sins. He was praying to Mary. He was lighting the candles. He was doing it all. But he, there was no peace in his life. So he thought, well, I got to do more. Maybe if I become a Catholic monk, I'll grow closer to God. Maybe if I beat myself, I'll get closer to God. Maybe if I fast until it becomes medically dangerous, maybe that'll work or Maybe maybe I have it too good. Like you said, I'll go out and scrub all the bricks or I'll sleep on the cold, hard floor until I catch a cold to the point where I become so sick. If I suffer, I get closer. I just want to do whatever I can to experience the peace of God in my life. But that peace would never come because the Catholic Church couldn't give him the peace. Yeah. But he found something that could. And it was one verse as he was studying the Bible. And when he found there was a verse that the Catholic Church couldn't give him and a piece that the Catholic Church couldn't give him, so the Catholic Church couldn't take it away from him. And that verse said, It is by grace ye are saved 
through faith. It is not what you have done. It is the gift of God so that no man can boast. And because he found the truth of that one verse, because the Holy Ghost made that verse come alive in his life, he had a spiritual one-man revival. And let me just tell you something right now. My God is so powerful that that's all he needs to start a revival is one man set on fire for God. You know, Satan, he might need the Antichrist, the false prophet, he might need the Nephilim, the UN, the Illuminati, the New World Order. He needs this whole entire satanic system working together to try to get the job done. And he won't even be able to get it done with everything at his disposal. But you know all God needed? One man. That's all God needs is one man. He only needed David to stand against Goliath, right? Or the Philistine army. He only needed Gideon, Samson, or any of the judges. He only needed Samuel the prophet to stand against the Philistines. And most importantly, he only needed one man who was also God. He only needed Yeshua. Amen. But we see prophetically in the end times, like I said before, he's going to have more than one man. He's going to have an army of men that are going to be strong, that are going to know who their God is, and they are going to do exploits. Like Martin Luther, they're going to know what the Scripture says. And, it's, and Martin Luther knew what the Scripture said, right? He knew what the Catholic Church taught him. When he was a monk, he knew what the—I mean, they did all the Masses in Latin. They did all that stuff in Latin. We'll talk about why they did that in a minute. But he knew. He was theologically trained in his mind, and yet he was still sleeping on rock floors. He was still beating himself with whips. He knew the scriptures, but the scriptures didn't know him, right? right? The scripture wasn't alive to him. When that one verse became alive in his spirit, when the Holy Ghost breathed life upon that scripture, when he stopped reading for information and was reading for impartation, that one truth, changed his world. And that's what the people of God who know their God will do. They, yeah, will be able to quote scriptures because they will have memorized scriptures. They will have esteemed the word of God so powerful that they will have hid it in their heart like Mary did when she hid the truths and the promises of God in her heart, as it says in the Bible. But more importantly, these are going to be a people that the word of God knows. Amen. These are going to be the people whose prayers are heard in the halls of heaven. These are going to be the people whose Bibles had tear stains in them because they were crying out to God for a move of God for his protection. Mm. But all he needs is one man. And then if he has an army, look what he did with 12 disciples, right? 12 disciples who are willing to stand with Yeshua. Or even if he has two people, look what Paul and Silas did. Acts 17.6 said these people in the early church turned the world upside down. And that's King James language. These are they that turn the world upside down. Imagine what God can do with a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 people. Now, I know that if you read Revelation 7:14 that John is actually going to see a number or a multitude of people come out of the great tribulation who are getting saved during the tribulation. Now, how did these multitudes of people get saved? How did they come out of the, the time where it was the most dangerous to get saved? I mean, like, you're not giving an altar call saying, come for your best life now in the middle of the tribulation. No. It's going to be the darkest period. It's going to be a time of great danger and turmoil, but yet it's going to be a powerful period. And in the midst of this time frame of complete danger, there's such a huge spiritual revival that John's looking and he sees this whole multitude get saved. How do they get saved? Well, how did this multitude get prepared for Yeshua's first coming? It did so because there was a man named John the Baptist. You see, God always will have a people, a remnant, who know him. And these people will be like John the Baptist. They're going to live in the wilderness for a while. These are people that you do not know, that are out there, that, that the world hasn't heard of. These people probably don't have degrees and they probably don't have business suits. Maybe they do. But these are people right now who God is doing business with in the prayer closets of the world. 
That's right. These people are people that are living in a place of spiritual barrenness themselves, like Martin Luther. These people are people that that are only sustained by the presence of the Lord because they're crying out. There are people crying out to God saying, God, move in our lives, move in our lives powerfully. And then like John the Baptist, these people are going to proclaim the second coming of Yeshua. And they're not going to do it. And there's, there's a movement out there called the Forerunner Movement that says that there's all kinds of crazy New Age con- contemplative prayer thing that's going to happen. There's going to be a John the Baptist group of prophets rise up. That's kind of not biblical. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a group of men and women who know their God, know what the scripture says, will quote the scriptures instead of the, the flowery promises and prophecies floating in their heads. They are going to have a message that is unique to this period, and it's going to say, repent for the kingdom of of God is at hand. That's what John the Baptist Mm -hmm. preached. That's what Martin Luther preached. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeshua is about ready to return. And when he returns, he's going to put all his enemies under his feet. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Messiah. So they're going to say, you need to surrender to this rule now. You need to join this kingdom now. Don't wait until he comes back, because when he comes back, he's going to fight against all those who hinder love and all those who are into sin and all those who would stand against his kingdom. So join the right side now. That's the group of people that are going to be the remnant. That's the thing that's going to happen in these end times. That's right. And the ones that have been called, we're preparing the way in the wilderness exactly the same way that John did. God says in the Bible that to know how it all ends, you have to start back at the beginning. Mm. So everything is virtually, it's repeating itself, but it's a different era. And things are different, but the same things are happening. Amen. And, you know, the thing is, is that maybe... God doesn't necessarily prefer that we go through these bad times. It just happens. I mean, I think God's perfect plan would have been from, you know, the church got away and the dark ages happened, and that happened because the church fell into apostasy at about 400 AD when the dark ages fell. I don't think it was God's perfect plan that that the church would go into apostasy so that he could have a reformation later. He probably would have wanted the church to always be stronger and to keep growing and growing and growing and growing in power. But the moment they did fall into apostasy, he wasn't like, I'm going to shut the church down. I'm going to move on to plan B. Because the church has always been God's plan A. He doesn't have a plan B. Mm -hmm. But he could have shut everything down, but he was like, no, no, my mercy is I'm going to withdraw myself now for a little while. My mercy is that I'm going to save a remnant of people, people like Luther, people like William Tyndale, and then I'm going to show up in power. I mean, think about it this way. If Martin Luther would have showed up, right, with this message of freedom from the Catholic Church, but people were happy with the Catholic Church, if people were like, no, we love the Catholic Church, we love paying our last few pennies as taxes for indulgences so that we can get out of purgatory, we love being abused and molested by the popes and the priests, we love the fact that we don't have to read the Bible for ourselves, we love being told what it says, we trust that the priests would never leave anything out. They would have called Martin Luther an idiot and they would have rushed him out of town. Yes. But... Because there was a spiritual hunger when Martin Luther showed up, people had ears to hear. And that's what gives me hope for this moment in history, because the same conditions that really existed back then exist now. And if God can do it like he did it back then, he can do it again now. Like you said, at the end is the beginning. Because it says in Acts 10.34 that God is no respecter of persons. If he did it, back with Martin Luther. He can do it today with somebody we probably don't even know exists yet. If he did it in the days of the Reformation, he can do it again. It says in Hebrews 13, 8, that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, that all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Mm -hmm. Unto the glory of God through us. 
Now that's a trippy part. If you, that's something that when I read it, I'm like, oh man, I wish he wouldn't have said that because not only is the glory of God present, but he's choosing to use someone in an imperfect vessel to display that power. That literally means that he fulfills the promises that he makes to mankind through the church, through us, through a vessel, even if it's imperfect like the church. And he chooses to fulfill promises to mankind this way because it brings a certain amount of glory to his name, that he can take something that the world says is unredeemable and redeem it. He loves a good prodigal son story. He loves an underdog story. So he'll take things that are broken down and use them for the glory of God. So if the promises of God are yea and amen unto Christ Jesus, and we know that the glory that he gets from it is not for us, but it's through us, then when he makes the promise that if we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sins, and he will heal our land. Not for our glory, but for his. When you have a bunch of people going and writing books on 10 Steps to Revival and and fly me out to your mega conference in million dollar jets so that I can preach a message of revival, that's not what I'm talking about because God gets no glory in that. No. God wants the glory for himself, and he does it through a church that would humble themselves, pray, seek their face. And I, I, when I read the Bible, I choose to see that if there is a multitude of people that no man can number getting saved during the tribulation, during the time, like I said, when it's the most dangerous to be a Christian, at a time that makes the dark ages literally look like sunshine and lollipops, then I logically have to deduce that it happened not just spontaneously or just by some random act, that this revival that John saw happened specifically because God kept his promise in his word, because that's how it works, and that at some point the church did humble themselves, they did pray, they did seek his face, there was a portion of the church that literally turned from their wicked ways and called out to heaven because that's how the revival happens. Mm -hmm. Correct? I mean, that's just logical deduction. I don't even need to be a Christian to use the skill of logical deduction. Yeah, you're totally the real, right. The, the, the real question isn't if it's going to happen. The real question is, are you a part of it? The real question is, isn't, does he use the church in America? Because the church in America may or may not be part of this end times revival. Right, and Maybe you're not the talking about uh, the building. You're talking about people. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the church, right. I'm talking about, and even the people that would call themselves the church in America. Because, like, there's people that would, that would say, oh, I'm part of the church because I go to Joel Osteen's church. Well, you're not part of the church unless you're saved by the blood, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people will say that God can't use the American church because it's so broken down or it's in such apostasy or whatever they want to say. And you know what? I can't disagree with that because the Bible says that God removes lampstands when they don't shine anymore. So does God remove the American church so that the rest of the church can fulfill the promise of repenting and humbling themselves and praying so that there can be a revival? Maybe. Or... Does the church in America become a beacon of hope again? Maybe. That part, we're going to have to decide. Yes. But here's the thing. We have a chance. Because the conditions, like I said, of the dark ages were the same now as they are back then. Mm -hmm. And when I look at all the shenanigans that are going on in America, yeah, it's easy to write us off. But, but... Let's 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 talk about some of the things that were going on back then, because maybe maybe that will help spark hope in us that it's possible again. So I think the, the proper place to start, Kay, would be with the Catholic Church, because they were a big culprit in the the stranglehold that Satan held on the people, because the one of the biggest problems of the dark ages was the catholic church and what the catholic church wanted to do was take the power of the word of god away from the common people yes very much and if so satan can, if satan can do that he can neuter the power and effectiveness of the church it becomes well, church corrupted yeah it does it becomes corrupted it becomes 
it becomes less than it should be. It becomes, and it even, what's even more scary is the church becomes a laughing stock at some point. Because if you think that the world thinks Benny Hinn is cool, just because you think Benny Hinn is cool, you're wrong. People watch Benny Hinn and they're like, that dude's a joker. Look at all these people rolling around on the girl ground. Or if you think that it's cool that what happened at the Toronto airport where people were rolling around on the ground and barking like dogs and oinking like pigs saying that was of God, then you're wrong. People in the world, when we chase after that stuff, they laugh at us. They laugh at us and say, man, these Christians are stupid. When we start doing things that are bad, our testimony gets watered down. Our testimony mm-hmm. becomes wrong, and the church actually becomes a stumbling block to people. But the church, if the church is going to be a stumbling block, we should be the stumbling block of people going to hell. We should be like, okay, we're going to be a stumbling block. We're not going to let you go to hell. Over our dead bodies are you going to hell. And by, by our dead bodies, I mean by our prayer and our fasting and our dying to self and picking, picking up our cross and following Yeshua. That's yes. the, what the church should be doing. But we don't because we don't. We've, we've had the word of God neutered from us. We haven't esteemed it properly. And let's start with the Catholic Church because I'm just rambling and tangenting at this point. Let's get. Let's, let's, very let's interesting. Our, Everything you're let's, saying is is totally let's true. Nose, let's, let's put our nose to the grindstone. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be three episodes, man. Let's talk about the Catholic Church. Cool. Oh yeah, that is where it, it virtually it was manifested that I see the corruption where it began they wanted complete control over the people and if you control their belief systems you actually control the people amen and that's why the catholic church power was so absolute because they controlled the people you're a hundred percent right and that's why they were more powerful than the king Because the Mm -hmm. king understood that if you didn't have the hearts of the people under your submission, then you couldn't control them. So, like, the king would always have to check with the pope. Because the pope said, man, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, I'm just going to tell the people that they're going to go to hell if if they, they follow what the king says. And the king's like, well, then I'll change my position. So the king even knew. The political system even knew that in order to gain the hearts and minds of the people, you had to attack their religious beliefs. And that's why the false prophet... And the one world religion is so important to the Antichrist because without him, no one's going to worship the Antichrist and join the beast system. Because according to Revelation 13, it's the false prophet who makes the image of the beast, right? Yes. It's the false prophet who commands or makes the image of the beast. And the image of the beast actually commands people to take the mark of the beast. It's not the Antichrist himself. It's the religious system that has its hands in all of this. Now, the Catholic Church kept people under their control through one word and one word only. And that word was excommunication. Yes. If you could threaten people with excommunication, you would scare the heck out of them. Martin Luther was scared. He thought if he died outside of the Catholic Church, he would go to hell. And this is how devious this plan was. Because if you look at the time of the Dark Ages, the thing that you're going to notice is the death rate was astronomical. They didn't have the medicine we had now. Their medical practices were like, you know, Tom and Jerry medicine, you know. They did things that you shouldn't be doing to people. They were leeching people. I mean, just like bad, bad stuff. There were plagues also at this time, decimating huge bits of the population, People took their mortality so seriously because everyone was afraid they were going to die. I think that's where infant baptism even became so popular because the Catholic Church at one point was even like, hey, uh, if if you don't baptize your kid, they're going to hell. So Mm -hmm. the Catholic Church capitalized upon the fear of death very strategically. And here's how they did it. First, they said that the Catholic Church was the only true church that you could go through to be saved. And they did this through something called apostolic succession. And basically what that means is they believe that Peter was the first pope and that the current pope, right, that we have now is just following an unbroken chain of command, even though Rome was not the first headquarters of the first church. If you look in the book of Acts, Jerusalem was. And Peter wasn't the head of the Jerusalem church. 
Yeshua's half-brother, James, was. And I say half-brother because Yeshua's father was God, and it wasn't Joseph. But the Catholic Church doesn't want to talk about Mary having other children because they teach that Mary was a, perfect, a perpetual virgin, virgin, even though Yeshua had half-brothers. But Yeshua never, ever, ever said that he would build the church on Peter. That would be sheer blasphemy. Yes. The Bible is very clear who the cornerstone is. The Bible is very clear that the church is built upon Yeshua as the cornerstone. Yeshua alone is the rock of ages, the rock of salvation. If you read the passage in Matthew, Yeshua is saying that he's going to build the church not on Peter, but Peter's confession that Yeshua was the rock, that Yeshua was the living son of God. It was upon Peter's confession that he was going to build this church. That The confession that says, you're the son of the living God. And they were saying that their pope was the true successor, that it was mm -hmm. Peter. And that the, the Catholic Church was the mother church that gave life to everyone. And so that if the mother church was giving you life, then only the mother could bring you to life, and then only the mother could save you. And they had people hooked by their fear of dying outside of the Catholic Church through excommunication, which basically brought heresy number two to light. So first we had heresy number one of the universal apostolic succession church. The second heresy was their version of communion, because if you excommunicated someone, then they couldn't take communion. And the Catholics really used this thing of communion to their advantage. It was another way they controlled the population. They said that the communion service itself was a very special ritual that only the priests could perform. And it was called the Mass. And it actually became a ritual where they said that the bread and the wine became the very body and blood of Christ through the process of something called transubstantiation, which basically means the priests were performing a magic ritual where they would say that they were crucifying the Lord again and that they were turning the bread and the wine into the very body and blood of Christ. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the term mass basically means a funeral ceremony, which again is so blasphemous because the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18 and in Romans 6.10 and in Hebrews 9.28, this quote, it says that Yeshua died once for all. It uses that word, died once for all, in all three of those verses. Mm -hmm. You see, the Bible says that when Yeshua died, he finished it forever. His blood sacrifice paid the penalty of sin once for all, for anyone who would come to him and say, I need to be saved. And right now, he is interceding for us before the throne of God. The Bible says so in 1 Timothy 2, 5, that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yes. But the Catholic Church said, no, 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 no. It's the priest that performs the intercession before God. That's why there's an altar in a Catholic Church. That's why the priest faces it, right, when they're doing the sacrifice of communion. They're trying to replicate a temple ritual, and they're doing it kind of for show. It, it, it's a show so that they seem really important, that they seem like they're this unbroken Levitical priesthood that then was passed on to Peter, that was then passed on to them, and that if they were the only ones who could administer the Lord's sacrament, so if you didn't do exactly what you said, well, then you couldn't take communion, and you couldn't right. be saved, and then you would die in the dark ages of a bubonic plague, and you would be forever hopelessly out of luck. And not to interrupt you, um, BDK, oh, um, also in those days, as far as receiving the sacraments, they got to the point that those sacraments were reserved only for people that had money. Yep. If you did not have the money to pay for a sacrament, you did not receive it. If you did not have the money to pay for the last rites, you did not receive it you would not be absolved of your sins. And they were the 
ultimate deception. Because, and they had that power because people were not able to read the Word of God themselves. So the, the Catholic Church could say anything they wanted and do anything they want, and people were at their mercy. They were, and, and it was psychological, too, because it looked legit, because there were robes, and there were altars, and there were religious trappings. And we got to be careful, because there's a lot of apostasy in the modern-day church that looks legit because of the suits and the ties and things like that, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that but, the Bibles have been changed today. Yeah. There are so many corrupted Bibles that, to me, that also ties back into the Reformation era, because they were not getting the truth back in the Dark Ages. And with the Bibles that are being changed now, people are still not getting the truth. Well, yeah. And the way they did it in the Dark Ages is a little different than what they're doing it now. But in the Dark Ages, the problem that they had was not only were they wearing the robes to make them seem more apparent, more holy than everyone else, not only did they make them take vows of celibacy to further put them apart as these untouchable, special spiritual people, but they were educated beyond what the normal man was educated as so that they could read Latin. Yes. And the Bibles at the time were in Latin. And not only were the Bibles in Latin, but the masses were in Latin. The songs were in Latin. The, the, the average person couldn't understand it even if they wanted to. And if they wanted to, they weren't allowed to. Because they were told that they didn't have the spiritual tools to properly do what the priests did. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it was Martin Luther, correct me if I'm wrong, but also when he started waking up and realizing exactly what was going on within the Catholic Church and the, that what needed to get out to the people, he was one of them that he would walk around and he would be praying or he would be speaking what he had figured out in the Bible. And he was labeled a mutter because yeah, he, was. he was speaking in Latin and people thought he was just muttering that he was um, out of his mind. Yeah, they accused him of being a lot of things. They accused him of being insane. Mm -hmm. They accused him of being a heretic. They accused him of being full of sedition because one of the things Martin Luther really had it on his heart to do was once he, once he got saved and realized that the problem was uh, a famine in the land, not so much from the things of the Dark Ages, but a famine for hearing the Word of God, he wanted a translation of the Bible in German that people could understand. And yes. not only that, but he wanted a translation of the, the, the church service. He wanted people to come to his church and be able to hear it in German, the common language of the day. And he was a big believer in the power of praise and worship mm -hmm. because – because cause he realized that music was so important to God that there were, like the book of Psalms is just all music. That's beautiful. So he did something that we think is awesome in the fundamental church world. Uh, we sing Martin Luther's songs like A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And we say that if we're not using organ music and singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that we're... We're sinning. I've actually heard people say that anything that doesn't have the beat of those old school songs that has a rock beat or a synth beat or or some sort of wild beat or rock and roll or whatever the thing is or a rap hip hop beat, whatever the common beat of the day would be, it's it's of the devil. Really? Well, let me tell. Yeah, let me tell you something. Like, there's even a, there's even I won't go into this guy's ministry, but. There's there's a well-known fundamentalist Baptist and Baptist preachers that preach against rock and roll, even Christian rock and roll. There and they hate Christian rock and roll more than they hate right. There are people that hate Christian rock and roll more than they hate real rock and roll. And I'm not saying that you know like that rock and roll that's obviously that has satanic lyrics and things like that are good because they're not. But to say that there's no such thing as good Christian music is crazy. And and if you're gonna sit back and say, well, okay, fine, I won't listen to the Newsboys. What should I listen to? 
And they're going to hand you that old red hymnal, and they tell you to turn to a mighty fortress is our God, and they say, sing this instead. Then you go and you tell them, do you understand where this song came from? Because Martin Luther wanted people to be able to sing in their own language because he wanted people not to have to do it in Latin. He went into the bars where they sang the most foulest songs. He took the melodies that he heard there that the common man knew by heart and just put Christian lyrics to it. It's the same thing they do with music. So that's his heart for the thing. Yes, he was trying to get through to the people to break their thinking that the Catholic Church had just ingrained from them into them for their whole lives. You know, it all ties in with, you know, the second point that you've made, that they had the control and how the their sacraments, everything that they took on being the actual body of Christ and re-crucifying him. And it was just so much manipulation. Well, the other thing that they really did that was huge, that really kept the people under their thumb, especially the people in politics, was, and this is something Martin Luther really hated, he said, you confess your sins to Jesus, not a priest. Because the priests in the confessional booths were one of the biggest sources of corruption and blackmail back then. Mm -hmm. Because the priests knew every secret in that community because people would come and willingly confess to them. And they didn't keep it in strictest confidence. They'd go report it back to their bishops and the bishops would report it to the Pope. And they would use it for blackmail. They would use it for money. They would use it for extortion. They would use it for political capital. The thing is, is that God wants you to confess yourself to him. You don't have to confess your sins to a priest. There's only one mediator. But they wanted to set it up like they were the only game in town, the only way to God, that they had complete and utter control. And we sit back and say, well, okay, the Catholic Church isn't like that today. And I'm not ripping on Catholic people, okay? If you're someone who's in a Catholic church and you love Jesus, then I just pray that you really, really start lining up what you're hearing with the Word of God and really seek, really seek in your heart to see if they're teaching you the truth. Because I'm not here to, to rip on you if you're a Catholic. I love you. Amen. As a as a person who is who is on a spiritual journey to find truth in Jesus. But I'm not going to lie to you either. The Catholic Church is not the way to do it. Okay? But I'm not putting you under condemnation. But the Catholic Church, and you, and you know this is if you're, if you're a strong Catholic, and I've witnessed the Catholics, and they've told me, I don't even need to listen to you because you're not, in, you're, not a, you're not an official priest. You're not an official pastor. You can call yourself a pastor. You can call yourself a minister, but you weren't in any of the apostolic line of succession. They still teach that today. As a matter of fact, this new pope, who's supposed to be super inclusive and super all-common man, he is a huge proponent of that there are no moral free agents. He's come out and said that fundamentalism even needs to be stopped because they're the biggest problem in the church. He says that only the Catholic Church can save a Christian. But then out of his mouth, that same mouth, he will turn around and tell people of other faiths that they're all good and that they can worship other gods. But if you're Christian, you need to go through the Catholic Church. But if, if, if you're a Muslim, then it's all good because you, you still worship Allah. And, and he's pushing that one world religion today because the NWO, the New World Order, and the Antichrist system need the hearts and the minds of the people under their control. It's nothing new. He's still using the Catholic Church, and he's using the New World Religion. And the new pope, man, he is the man of the hour. He is the man to do it. He came out of nowhere. He wasn't a name on anyone's radar. And he basically, coming out of nowhere, Instantly, people loved him. I remember watching when they when he first came out. The Catholic Church was in such a state of disarray that when this guy came out, there wasn't anyone saying, "Oh, this guy's a bad choice." They were like, "Oh, look at how humble he is." It's like the media already had the talking points and how awesome this dude was mm-hmm. before he even was in day two of his popistry. It's like the they before he term. was put there. Yeah, because he was put there for a reason. All right, uh, um, a few weeks, a few weeks after he started as pope. 
Time magazine runs this cover story on him, and on the cover of this magazine, they have a giant picture that says, One World Pope. Well, how do you know? He's only been in office for a few months or a few weeks. How do you know he's the One World Pope? How do you know he's this man of reform? He hasn't had a chance to prove his platform out yet. No, there were talking points. No, this man was anointed for a specific reason. He had been satanically choosed and anointed to lead people further into the NWO's United Nations of Religion. And if people out there have just flipped out and said, I don't believe you, BDK, now you're just being conspiracy, can I take like five minutes and share some quotes from news articles to prove my point? Because I don't want to just... That's a strong statement to make about a world re a leader of Christianity, supposed Christianity. Yeah. And if I could, could I just back up my uh, oh, please point do. with a couple things? Please do, cool. BDK. You know, this uh, deception detection is all about truth. So please That's what I appreciate free. about your show, man. Okay, so last year the Jerusalem Post reported this story with this headline, and it said, quote, Perez proposes United Nations for Religions to Pope at Vatican. And then the article says this, quote, Vatican City, former President Shimon Perez emerged from a Vatican City audience with Pope Francis Thursday after proposing a kind of United Nations for religions. That's their term, not mine. Perez 91, who was the world's oldest leader, head of state of Israel, nonetheless, until his term ended six weeks ago, met with Francis amid heightened tensions in the Middle East. He used the talks to highlight human rights abuses from Hamas and to, ri and to discuss the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. But the main topic of conversation was Perez's idea to create a UN-like organization that he has called the United Religions. Perez said that the Argentina-born pontiff was the only world figure respected enough to bring an end to the wars raging in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. Unquote. Then Breitbart, or Breitbart reported this news story, quote, U.S. representative in Rome to push for global covenant of world religions. Quote, Rome provides a neutral brokerage where religious leaders can work together for peace, says Jerry White, U.S. Dep Dep US Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. In an interview with Vatican Radio, White spoke of the need for faith leaders to work harder to prevent religiously motivated violence. Islamic, Islamic State extremists have brought the question of faith and violence to the fore, and the world's religions must be in the forefront of the peace process. The type of violence growing in the world is religious-related, says White. Religion is a vocabulary that is being used every day as we look in the paper to justify violence. For this reason, religion has to be part of the solution, unquote. I feel like the powers that be have been pitting these various religions actually against each other for quite a while now to bring about this quote-unquote United Nations of Religions and to do this, the Pope really has been on a full court press to start co courting Islam, who is really an agent of, of chaos in this world. The AP reported this story, and it says, quote, Pope prays in Istanbul mosque in new outreach. This is from the Associated Press. It says this, Francis got down to the business of being Pope showing respect to Muslim leaders. Pope Francis stood Saturday for two minutes in silent prayer, facing east in one of Turkey's most important mosques, a powerful vision of Christian-Muslim understanding at a time when neighboring countries are experiencing violent Islamic assault on Christians and religious minorities, unquote. So now, now let me get this right, Kay. Um, neighboring countries are experiencing, quote-unquote, violent Islamic assault on Christians and religious minorities, and the world leader of religions, this pope, what's he doing? Is he standing up against it? No, he's getting down to the business of being pope. And how's he doing that? He's praying east towards Mecca. Mm -hmm. That's how he gets down to the business of being pope. That makes me completely irate, because how dare he supposed to be the 
quote-unquote Christian leader of the world, and that's how he's going to get down with his business while, while little kids are getting beheaded and women are being raped and babies are being raped and sodomized by Muslims around the world in ISIS. Amen. But it's, it's cool. It's cool for the Pope to, to sit back and say that they're all good because that's his business. Well, what is killing his business and business is good? So, so all they need right now, right, is this NWO churches, right? We, we just need to see some NWO churches on the street. Well, you're like, okay, well, whew, we're not seeing any NWO churches yet, so we're cool. We got time. Well, wait a minute. Now the End Begins reported this story last year. Quote, Berlin to build very first temple of Chrislam for one world religion. Berlin thinks it's making history as Muslim, Jews, and Christians join hands to build a place where they all can worship, the House of One, as it is being called. It will be a synagogue, a church, and a mosque under one roof. The House of One, right? Synagogue right? of Satan. So let me ask, yeah, who is this nameless one that they're calling the One? And why is it when the Pope came on television here in America, he didn't name Jesus? He said he came in his own name, and he didn't mention... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, I was wrong, Kate. He did mention Yeshua once on television, right? Right. He said that Yeshua was the world's greatest failure when he died on the cross. That's right. And, and let me tell you something, man. He wasn't. When Yeshua died on the cross, he was the world's greatest victory that was won in that moment because mm -hmm. in that moment he defeated hell in that moment he defeated death three days later when he rose from the grave that was the catalyst to ultimate victory but this just shows that the pope isn't even saved that's right because let he alone... even let the media call him jesus i don't yeah. care how anyone else words that and defends the media for saying that that is what they said, and that is what we take away. And they said that he is a miracle. I'm sorry. There's only one Jesus. Praise God. No man of... can be him but Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's a hot that's... spot for me. I'm sorry, but. No, no. Now, now you get on the soapbox and shout for a little while. Go for it, sister. It just, Hallelujah. there's no excuse for it because. In our hearts, we all know who Jesus is. And anyone who is walking with God and striving with God and tuned into God knows when they see someone like the Pope or these wolves in sheep's clothing, they know in their heart of hearts that this is a mockery. They are attempting to make fun of God and replacing Jesus with these, I, I'm sorry, I have to say this, people. It's They're replacing Jesus with these voodoo dolls. Amen, amen. No, you, 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 you preach. Go ahead. That's right. It, it just tears me up, and it brings me to tears. I mean, right now I want to cry because Jesus did so much, and he was not a failure. How mm. dare anyone say that he was a failure? I dare anyone to go through what Jesus did and do Amen. what he did. Amen. Amen. Man cannot do that. No one can do that. Anyone else, by the time they reached that cross, would have been dead. Mm. But he stayed. He said... It is finished. Before that, he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But there's no excuse for that now. We have the word of God. We have it in writing, which Martin Luther and Tyndale and all of them fought to have put into writing. There is no excuse for those words to ever be uttered again, according to the Bible. Forgive them, for they know not what they do, because we do know what we're doing. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. For your love gonna, and your mercy. Amen. Oh, we're going to have revival here in a moment. Yeah. All right. Whew. Oh, man. Hallelujah. That was good, Kay. That was good. Oh, he just moved me. He just, I praise God for putting 
his words in my mouth in moving me to this point because I have so much love for him and I am so thankful and I am so grateful for what these men did to make us able to read his holy word. They were Amen. his warriors then, like we are God's warriors now. We are like proclaiming the truth of God. We are trying so hard to do what we were told to do. Go to all nations and preach the gospel. And Amen. these men made it possible in the beginning. Jesus, the apostles, the, the men who Tyndale... Martin Luther, John Wesley, all of them that have made it possible for the Bible to be put in print. And now that is an inheritance to us. And we have been born in this time to get God's word out there. And we cannot let God down. We cannot let him down because he has never let us down. Amen. And 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 there's shoulders that we need to stand on. There's sacrifices that these men made that we shouldn't shame by our complacency. And I know that we're going to do a second episode, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna save all the rest of the similarities because there's there's awesome ones. But I just want to end like this because I think the spirit of God is here right now, oh, he right is. now. And I don't want to preach past the anointing because preachers tend to do that so that they can hear their own voice, right? But I don't care about my own voice. I just want to tell you something right now, right now. William Tyndale, right, that you just mentioned, he had a prayer. As he was dying, he prayed that the king of England's eyes would be opened to the power of the gospel. Yes. And we'll talk next week about how that all went down. But let me tell you something, man. That dying prayer, God honored. Because the Tyndale Bible, right, it is, it is I, I have a King James Version Bible. I'm holding it right now in my hand. I love my King James Version Bible, all right? I'm one of those people who, who, who just do, who's a King James person, all right? Deal with it if you don't like it. But I do. I'm a King James person. And I'll tell you something, man. It blows my mind that the Bible I'm holding right now in my hand, one estimate suggests that the New Testament in the King James Version is 83% Tyndale's work, and the Old Testament is 76% his work. The Bible I am holding in my hand stems back to the obedience of one man. Think about that, one man. The Bible I'm holding in my hand stems back to one man's act in a specific moment of time and his dying prayer for revival, that a person's eyes be opened to the truth. And that is my hope hope right now that your eyes get open to this awesome opportunity that we have to share the gospel. Amen. Amen. Because I see, and I will talk about it next week, how ripe the field is for another reformation if we get hungry enough for the moving of God in great power. If we can mm -hmm. put our pride aside, if we can stop putting all of our judgments upon this world, if we put it, our, 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 our eyes back into balance, right? If we stop saying that America and all these things, man, they're, they're without hope. If we just stop, stop, stop pro proclaiming gloom and doom all the time. Okay, I get it. I get it. You want to warn people, right? But whatever happened to the day where people warn people with tears? I, and I'm, I only say that right now because that should be your attitude. If you, if you can't be tender to the plight of people, then you have no business pronouncing judgment upon people. If the things that you're seeing in this world don't break your heart, then your heart needs to be broken. And you need to find a place of brokenness. And then you need to pray that your eyes be opened mm -hmm. to the truth and the power of God's word. We must cry out again for God to heal us, to break us, to do whatever it takes. We must cry out that God rises up a group of people that will stand like John the Baptist once again. 
once again, because I'll tell you something right now, right now, there are two set of circumstances that bring about a revival. There are two ways that church history says revivals happen. And this is why I love studying church history so much because it unlocks this simple truth. Revival throughout history either came about through persecution or it came about because people were crying out to God saying, God, have mercy. We, we, we need your mercy. We, 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 we don't want to have to suffer the persecution. It shouldn't have to take persecution to bring us to this point. We just want to cry out because it's the right thing to do. We just want your presence again. Stop hiding from us. We want to see your glory. And then, then when the people cried out, they cried out not because they were afraid of persecution. They cried out because they had spiritual hunger. Man, they would pray for weeks, months, years. They would cry out saying, God, move, move, move. We need you. If you don't, if you don't come and show up, we're going to die. Our churches will die. People, our neighbors will go to hell unless you start showing up in our churches and moving in power. Unless you start showing up in the coal mines and moving in power. Unless you start showing up in the jails and moving in power. Unless people who are walking by these churches are drawn into the churches because they have such a hunger in their heart. God, make people hungry. We're desperate for you. We're not stopping crying out. We're not stopping until we see you move. We're going to fast. We're going to repent. We're going to pray. We're going to be like Jacob who won't stop wrestling with you in prayer until you bless us, until you make us something that is a lot more than what we are now because because we are nothing. We are nothing unless you give us a new name. And truth be told, Kay, sometimes persecution and revival through prayer, these things can happen side by side even. There can yes. be persecution and then there can be a crying out and a hungry a hunger for God that happening side by side. And if I had to guess logically, I would probably say that in the end times, both these things will happen side by side. And we yes. could do a whole topic on just that. And, and it's a deeper prophetic topic on its own. But what I can say is this, is that no matter how it happens, the place of safety that we have never changes. And the surest and safest place to be found in any time of trouble is in the blood of Yeshua. Yes. The Bible says that the crucible of our faith is refined through the fires of persecution because it makes us do the inventory of our lives. It makes us leave behind the things that don't really matter anymore. It makes us take a bold stand for God when all the others around us have failed, when all of the other people around us no longer have the courage to take that stand. You know, I mean, in, in this moment, right? In this moment, it would be better for us to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are already in the fire, right? Already in the fire being protected by Yeshua, already safe and refined because we've already done that inventory of our lives. We don't need persecution to come and, and knock us upside the head and say, okay, now I'm going to refire, I'm going to refine you through great pain. It doesn't have to be that way. We can already be protected. We can already have done business with God. We just need to bow to him now. We just have to give him the chance to, to clean us out now through deep, deep hunger. And this okay. is where we need to be. Because I believe that this persecution isn't coming, Kay. I believe it's here. I believe this refining isn't about ready to happen. It's already happening. It is. And it's going to grow in intensity because Yeshua is purifying his bride. He is making her without spot or wrinkle because he deser desires to move in power through a vessel. And he deserves a pure vessel. And he will only yes. move through a clean and holy vessel because... Well, the Holy Spirit's holy. We call him the Holy Spirit, but we expect him to move through an unholy vessel. That's ludicrous. Yes. So when, so when times of trials come and when people start falling away or they, they're being removed because of scandal or such things, what it really does is it purifies his body. It makes us more clean. It takes away just one more spot. It straightens out just like one more wrinkle. But praise God, because God is long-suffering. And the Bible says that a bruised reed, he will not break. Now, you may sin, I may sin, but we don't have to stay there. We can get back up 
We don't have to make peace with sin. We can fight sin. We, 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 we may go through periods in our life where there is so much dryness. It may seem like we're in our own personal spiritual dark ages, but it doesn't have to stay that way. You can always pursue God harder than you pursued him yesterday. You can always cry out deeper than you cried out yesterday. You can always, always, always humble yourself, repent, turn from your wicked ways, seek his face, cry out for a personal Holy Ghost revival. And and if you're not sure, if you're not sure in this moment, if you're not sure that that if you die, if you die, that you would go to heaven, then you can be sure. Because today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow isn't promised to anyone, and you don't have to wait, because God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. You don't have to go to a Catholic church to be saved. There's no games being played here. The only thing that matters in this moment is the Holy Ghost leading you to salvation. Yes. People ask me all the time, how do I know if God will save me? And I tell them the answer is simple. If you feel God tugging at your heart to get saved, he will save you. He doesn't lead you to a place where he's not ready to empower you. Mm-hmm. So call out to him right now because he is here right now. What is your trouble? because he is present to help you through it. The Holy Spirit right now is speaking to the earbuds that you may have in your ears. He's speaking through them. He's speaking through your speakers. And like we prayed before, I don't care if you're hearing this five years from now, he's still present because we've laced this message with Bible verses. And what he's really saying, what he's really saying is come to me and I will cleanse you. He's saying, come, come, listen to the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost is here right now, and the Holy Ghost is whispering to you. He's saying, come, reason together with me. And if your skin, if your sins are as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Ask me, ask me. The Holy Ghost is, is the person, and he's saying, ask me, ask me, what, what, what do I need to repent of? And he'll show you. Ask him to work godly sorrow in your heart to make you sorrowful over the things that you know you should be sorrowful, but you're just not. Ask him to give you the power to turn from these things. And ask him how to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. If you ask the Holy Spirit to do these things from the bottom of your heart, and then you in obedience follow what he tells you to do, he will give you the words to pray. He will give you the godly sorrow you need to repent and he will lead you to the one who is the truth. Because John 16, 13 says that when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. And he has come to you now in this moment, and he is willing to lead you, and he can lead you home into salvation, or he can lead you into living a sold-out radical kingdom lifestyle, but only if you let him. Only if you ask him to do it from a place of sincerity and surrender. Because Jesus didn't fail. He won the victory for you. Yes. I don't care what Pope Francis and his Catholic Church has told you. Jesus did not fail. There is not one drop of Yeshua's precious blood that was ever in vain. And let me tell you something, one of those drops had your name on it because he engraved you upon the palm of his hand, the Bible says. That's right. Your name was on his mind when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Maybe you don't even understand the own gravity of your sin, but that's cool, man. Because if you ask the Holy Ghost to show you the gravity of your sin, to work godly sorrow in your heart so you can get saved, oh, he will do it. He will the only hold question, that mirror up to you. That is for yeah. sure. And he doesn't do it to be mean. He does it because he loves you. He wants to lead you gently into a place of sincerity and surrender. But that first step is up to you. And I ask you, won't you do that today? Don't wait. Would you do it today if you have any doubts in your mind? If you die, you'd stand before heaven. Are you like Martin Luther, man, who, who had an experience on a road and said, if I die, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven? You have a sure hope that Martin Luther died because you have the word of God and you can read it and understand it better than he could back then. Mm-hmm. 
It, you don't, it's not in Latin. It, it, it's, in, it's in a language that you can understand. And the Holy Ghost will speak to you in words that you can understand through this. Will you take the first step today in pursuing a radical walk with the Lord? Amen. Amen. And I need to add something to that, BDK, as we close. It made me think of the story of Saul. Mm. Saul had persecuted and killed all these people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And God touched him. He showed him what he had done wrong. I mean, I will do a longer Bible study on this. But the thing is, what Saul did, so many sins, and God called him to him and forgave him and used him to spread his holy word. Saul ended up becoming Paul. And you know what a key figure Paul is in the Bible with the gospel. Whatever sin you have, God will forgive you. Salvation is there for the asking. Just as what BDK said. He could no one could have said it any better than what BDK just did. But just keep in mind that no matter how big or how many sins you have, God will always forgive you if you ask. Don't wait. Ask God to forgive you today to show you. And if you need help with that, I know that BDK is available because he has that on his website. And I hear him say that. And I'm available too. If you have any questions, we will be more than happy to answer them. We, we pray for you. We pray for all of you. We pray for the salvation of everyone. As BDK said, we do not want to see not one soul go to hell, but be redeemed in the blood of the Lamb. We love each and every one of you, and you're all just so important to us. And if you're that important to us, just imagine how important to God you are. And He knows you personally. Praise God. Mm. BDK. Spirit has been Amen. just with us tonight. And yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else even to say, Kay, except I'm looking forward to doing next week's and finishing up some of this information. But I'm afraid to even say anything right now, man, because I just feel God's presence here, and I just want to get out of the way. I would like to say the closing prayer. Please do. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, where can I begin I don't know where to begin to thank you for your power. You are always with us. But there are times, Lord, that you make it known. You want us to know, hey, I'm here. Your presence has been so felt tonight that there are just no words to express the feelings that when you lay your hands on us, Lord. It is a feeling that's indescribable. It's such a feeling of love that cannot be felt anywhere else except through you. You've guided this broadcast. You have brought BDK and I together and all these people, Lord, that are listening, that are hungering for you and for your word. I thank you so much for giving us your words to speak, Father. And I ask that every ear that your words through us fell upon reach the heart and souls of those listening. Anyone who's not saved, Lord, please let them hear your voice calling. And anyone that is saved, Lord, let it touch them. Let it lift them up. Let, them, let it give them the sense of urgency to start sharing your word and to show them how to share your word, Father. Please bless each and every person that's out there and BDK and myself as we go through this upcoming week. Guide us, Lord. 
put us on your path. Lead us in the way that you want us to go to do your mission. Because we are here for you, Father, and we want you to use us in the way that we can glorify you and glorify the kingdom of God. Because there is, there is no other power mightier. Father, there is no other love out there that can quite touch us the way that yours does. And thank you so much, Father. I pray this in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 Wow. Oh, God, please use this to reach somebody. I don't know what it is about you, BDK, but every time I talk to you and we, when we are doing these broadcasts, I feel like, like the Holy Spirit just comes in and sits down next to me. Two. I love you so much, brother. I love you too, Kay. Mm. <sighs> wow. Where can you go from that? Yeah, I know. I was just, I, I was staring at my notes and I'm just like, I can't, I can't. Like after you, you were preaching, the Holy Ghost just fell. And I'm like, man, I want to give the altar call and just get out of the way. I don't, we can talk about more of it next week, but I just didn't want to preach past the anointing because the Holy Ghost just hit the, the show at one point, And I'm just like, man, just shut up and get out of the way, Matt. When he does that with me. It's a feeling that, which I know you, you're aware of, it's a feeling you can't compare with anything else. And you know that every word you're speaking is his word. You're not saying it, he is. Amen. And I pray that people hear that. BDK, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you too, Sister. Um, what we did on that podcast is dangerous because a lot, of, a lot of people, they just want to put on information or make it entertaining. We just let the Holy Ghost have his way. And I just appreciate that there's podcasts like yours out there that can sit back and say at some point, you know what, let's just let God move and let's just get out of the way. You don't hear that on podcasts hardly ever anymore. So the fact that you, you're, you're, you do that in your podcast and you just made it available for this moment to happen, Amazing. Mm -hmm. I just appreciate your ministry case so much, Thank so you. much. That was all God, though. He made the way. And I hear it in yours, too. You get to the point and I'll just sit and I'll just cry.